morning, everybody. We would uh, like to welcome you this morning to our Sunday morning services here at Ravenna Church of Christ. Um, we're glad all of you are here. I uh, see we may have a few visitors today. I'd like to give a reminder for the visitors that uh, we have the blue room visitor registration cards. We have some in the pews and there's some outside. We'd love it if you fill one out and drop it in the offering box. Uh, maybe we can get to know you a little better and hopefully maybe see you again. If you could now, uh, please, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you with thanks. We come to you with praise. As we always do and as we always should. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that you provide us this morning, to come together in fellowship and in worship with you. What you, that we're here, you're the reason we're here. We ask that uh, you help us this morning to glean the message that we receive. We ask that we feel your presence this morning. And as always, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your teachings. We thank you for your example. And we thank you for your love. Yes. Lord, we ask that uh, for those who aren't here today, you're with them. And you bless them as you've blessed us. And we ask that uh, should it be your will, you bring them back to us so that we can grow this congregation, so that we can serve you and follow your ways. We ask that today, your message hits us at heart. And we ask that any visitors that are here receive your message and that they see our dedication to you. Amen. All this today, Lord, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. everyone. If you could please uh, turn with me your song books, number 627. Once again, it's number 627. i 
think of the Garden of Eden back in Genesis 1 like a banquet that was prepared for Adam and Eve. They, they were eating at the Lord's table. They could eat the fruit of, of any tree, any tree in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now they were deceived, but even though they were deceived, they were still kicked out of the banquet when they ate from the wrong table, so to speak. And when they ate the forbidden fruit, they realized their nakedness, they tried to cover themselves with their own righteousness, and, and that didn't work out, did it? But God provided a sacrifice, and he clothed them with the animal's hide, and in and, and that way they were, they were clothed by God. Remember that? And we'll see in this brief discussion that sacrifice is a part of all the banquets that are mentioned in the Bible. We might remember that Joseph held quite a banquet in Egypt when his brothers, when they brought Benjamin to him. And then later, when the Israelites went into the Promised Land, that was also like a banquet. We might remember when the spies checked out the land and Joshua and Caleb gave back their report. They said, you know, we saw clusters of grapes so big that they had to carry them. Two men had to carry them on a pole. This was the land of milk and honey. If, if that's not a banquet, I don't know what is. And we might remember when David spoke of God's banquet when he said, thou preparest a table for me in the midst of mine enemy. You, know, you anoint my head with oil. 
my cup runs over. But even though the ge generations that followed David, they all have offered sacrifices and, and they held banquets, but they were offered with the wrong intent. And they were kicked out of the banquet too, weren't they? The northern tribes were sent into dispersion to Assyria. The southern tribes sent into captivity in Babylon. And even in Babylon there were banquets. But those were worldly banquets. You might remember Daniel and his companions, they refused to eat from Nebuchadnezzar's table. So like we saw in the garden, it's good to remember that we have to eat from the right table too, isn't that right? And if we eat from the wrong table, we'll be kicked out of the banquet too, won't we? But let's look at the heavenly banquet that Jesus, Jesus spoke of in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And I think it's enlightening when we look at this parable in the context of the history of the people of Israel. In chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. So, in other words, he sent the prophets to Israel telling them of this wedding banquet that was to come. And he sent Moses, Elijah, and the others. But the people didn't listen. They just went on about their business like they didn't even care. Verses 4 through 6. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. A lot of people don't know it, but Isaiah prophesied the same wedding feast in Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9, when he said, On this mountain, he talked about the heavenly Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. He will swallow up on the mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. But they didn't pay any attention to him either. Even while the law of Moses and all the prophets spoke of this truth even his own son came to tell him they wouldn't listen and what did they do they didn't like the message so they killed the messenger and what did the king do well verse 7 tells us the king was enraged he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city and this is what happened in 70 AD isn't it when Rome came down and burned Jerusalem so in this parable, Jesus is also prophesying what's about to happen. Then in verses 8 through 10, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited didn't deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the ones who were first chosen to come to the banquet refused and were destroyed. So much for the doctrine of divine election, eh? And so the host said to go out and invite all those who didn't deserve to come. So the apostles invited the sinners. They invited the Samaritans. They invited the Gentiles, who they considered dogs and all those who were considered the lowest of all men. But just like Adam and Eve were sinners in the garden, and those attending the wedding feast, we need to be properly clothed, don't we? That is, if we want to remain in the veil. Matthew 22, 11 through 14. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked him, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. 
Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So those who are clothed in Christ are cast out of the banquet, just like the first group who are clothed in their own self-righteousness. Can you see that? Just like all the feasts of the Bible, this wedding feast requires a sacrifice, mm -hmm. and God has provided us the greatest sacrifice of all. And like God provided sacrifice to clothe Adam and Eve in the garden, he provided the sacrifice of his son so we can clothe ourselves in Christ. Paul said in Romans 13, 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And it was revealed to John in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It's, it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. It's by his torn flesh and spilled blood that we enjoy our seats at this heavenly banquet today, isn't it? And it's by remembering his death in this way that we eat of the great we eat of the greatest sacrifice of all isn't that right so let's pray for the flesh Lord we can't thank you enough for the flesh that is broken for us to provide the bread at the wedding feast that we partake in today we pray that we remain clothed in you so that we can partake in your eternal feast in heaven, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for the blood. Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed for us until our cup runs over. We pray that we keep our lamps full of oil as we wait for the bridegroom's return, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please turn with me now in your solid books to number 387. <clears throat> Once again, that's number 387. Please turn.
turn with me now to number 410. Once again, this is number 410. My God and I go in the fields together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows you. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows you. He tells me of the years that went before me, when heavenly plans were made for me to be. When all was but a dream of dim conception, to come to life, earth's burden for receive. When all was but a dream of dim conception, to come to life, earth's burden for receive. My God and I will go for a together. We'll walk and talk as good friends should and do. This earth shall pass and with it come in trials. But God and I will go This earth shall pass, and with it come in trials. But God and I will go unendingly. <clears throat> if you'd like to mark in your songbooks at this time, number 280. Once again, that is number 280. That'll be our song of invitation this morning. And then after you have that marked, if you could please turn with me to number 481. <clears throat> Once again, that's number 481. Is it for me, dear Savior, thy glory and thy rest? For me, so weak and sinful, oh, shall I be so blessed? Oh, Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but Savior, my heart is at thy feet. I 
scripture reading this morning is from John 3 verses 1 through 8. That's John 3, 1 through 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is certainly good to see everyone this morning. We had just the slightest hint of some warm weather, and man, that was nice. And then something happened. Somebody turned down the thermostat. Um, but it is so good uh, to be together, to worship. We're continuing in our study on the teachings of Jesus. Uh, because as we seek to be just simply Christians, uh, you know, we need to know what Jesus taught. We need to know what he said to do, how he said to live. And so we're, we're trying to to be that, and we're trying to emulate that, and so it helps that we study that. Um, tonight, in our evening time together, uh, we're going to actually talk about the question, what is a, a Christian? Uh, and so I do hope that you can be with us for that, and I hope you, we're going to have a discussion on that topic, uh, because it's interesting, I think, if you ask uh, a dozen people, well, what is a Christian, uh, you might get a dozen answers. And some of those answers are right, some of those answers might not be right, uh, but I think it's a discussion that we need to have, uh, because there's what we know that we need to do, and then there is what other people think we might need to do. Uh, and so we'll be talking about that more this evening. But for today, we are in John, the third chapter. Now, a little bit of background here. Last couple of sermons uh, we took from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so that is Jesus teaching to a multitude. Uh, today in John chapter 3, Jesus teaches to one guy. But he's not just any guy, is he? Um, he's a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. We notice there from verse 1 a couple of very important things about Nicodemus. Um, so he is a Pharisee. So he is one of the Jewish leaders. Uh, you know, the Pharisees uh, were a very legalistic uh, group, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and there's actually a few others, uh, but they were the majority party of the Jew Jewish ruling council. Uh, and so Nicodemus appears to be a ruler of the Jews in verse 1. Uh, so he is someone of importance. So we have a Jewish leader coming to talk to Jesus. Now he comes by night, as we see in verse 2. Uh, because he didn't want anybody to know. That would be the only reason why he would go by night. Because if he came out publicly in the middle of the day, well, that had some political ramifications. But he comes to Jesus at night, and it's very interesting when you study Nicodemus, 
um, and his spiritual journey, and we, we will do that sometime, uh, because he goes from John 3 um, to, uh, you know, providing uh, for the burial needs right. of Jesus. And right. so uh, he has a, a very interesting spiritual journey. But he comes to Jesus by night and has a very telling statement. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Amen. And so he's coming to Jesus and he's acknowledging his authority. He's saying, look, we get that you're from God. But if you'll remember, uh, if you go back and read the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, uh, we see that the people are in awe at the teachings of Jesus. Uh, he teaches as one who has authority. And so the people are hearing these teachings, and they're really revolutionary because they're suggesting that you can know God. You, you can have a relationship. You can come and you can practice and be faithful, which is not what they were hearing from the Pharisees. And so one of the Pharisees comes to him at night and goes, listen, we know by your miracles that God sent you. And so what a moment. What a moment where the Jewish leadership acknowledges the power and authority of Jesus, but as we know in the story of Jesus, they don't honor that power and authority. So Nicodemus comes to him, and he uses this as a teaching moment, and Jesus was great about that. He uses this opportunity to give Nicodemus a little nugget of truth, a nugget of wisdom. Now Nicodemus, you know, he'll... I think he gets it eventually, but here in John 3, it throws him for a loop, all right? And it's really about this topic, you must be born again. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a topic, if you've gone to church, gone to any number of churches, you may have heard, you must be born again. Uh, there's even a, a, a descriptor, well, I'm a born again Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and like so many terms, sometimes there's a little confusion. Uh, like so many times, maybe there's a little uh, misinformation uh, and so we want to get to the text and see what does the Bible actually say on this topic. And the first thing that we note here in John chapter 3 is seeing the kingdom of God. Have you ever been excited about going somewhere? Have you ever been excited? I remember uh, when I was in high school, uh, I thought it was the coolest thing. Our youth minister arranged for us to go to a midnight movie premiere. You remember those? Man, those were the coolest thing, especially when you're a kid who's got like a 9 p.m. bedtime, right? And so I remember it was a Friday night, and we were going to see the set. It was going to be the second Star Wars. Well, second is a relative term if you're a Star Wars fan, right? Um, so episode two is what it was. And so it was episode two because nobody talks about episode one. And we were there, and we went to the movie theater, and it was, it was one of the coolest things that I've ever experienced from an entertainment standpoint. Because uh, we were there, and we were outside the movie theater because the line to get in, you know, they weren't going to let us in until 12.01. And so we were wrapping around the theater, and it's really cool, and we're standing there, a bunch of teenagers out late at night. We're such rebels. <laughs> and then... My youth minister's there, and there was another member of the church there, and that minister had brought some friends. And these were big dudes that he brought. They were like 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". They could lift a Buick. <laughs> well, come to find out, um, this was like half of the defensive line of the Tennessee Titans. Because it was the most random thing. They all liked saltwater fish. And they met at a fish store and became friends. So here we are, standing outside, ready for the opening premiere of Star Wars Episode Two. Me, the youth group, and a bunch of professional football players. One of the coolest experiences I have ever had. And then they opened the door, and we went in. I don't remember watching the movie. <laughs> I know I did. I know I got popcorn. I remember. I just don't remember watching the movie. I've watched it many times since then. But that expectation of the event, that expectation of the destination, got me excited. Well, it's that same feeling the Jews had when you talked about the kingdom of God. 
They had grown up for generations hearing about the kingdom of God. They taught it to their kids. One day, son, one day, daughter, you will get to see the kingdom of God. And so there, that was eager anticipation. Now, over time, it never happened. Time came and went, but they still held on to that eager expectation. And so when we get into verse 8, uh, excuse me, verse 3, um, we see that Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so for Nicodemus, who is presumably a faithful Jew, that statement is very world-shaking, right? Because what Jesus is saying, hey, this thing that you have pinned your hopes and dreams on, this thing that you have been waiting for, your fathers were waiting for, your grandfathers were waiting for, you can't get unless you are born again. And so the big motivation about why to be born again, why that was important, was being born again is essential to seeing the kingdom of God. Now, a couple of things here is this kingdom is so anticipated, okay, that we go back into Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 to 45, and this is what we read, okay, about God's kingdom. It says, in those days, or in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. It shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and then it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this? The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And this is the prophet Daniel, and he is foretelling this kingdom that is going to be established. And if you go back and you look through history and you look through antiquity, you can see how all of uh, you know the maps change over time based on who owns what territory, right? I remember I was in school. You know, I started my school journey in the early '90s, right? I was in school for the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and public education is what public education has always been, underfunded, and so it took them a while to get the new maps. So I was probably well into middle school before I didn't have a map that said USSR. <laughs> and so kingdoms can change, right? Kingdoms can change. The kingdom that God was going to establish would never change. It would always have the same boundaries. It would always have the same ownership. It would always have the same king. It would always have the same people. And so God is going to set up this kingdom. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, 17 to 19, the psalmist says, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Now the reason why I pull two Old Testament verses as we talk about this idea of seeing the kingdom of God is that Nicodemus would have memorized this. He would have known this. And so he would have known about Daniel's prophecy about the kingdom that cannot be shaken. He would have known that God is going to establish a kingdom that rules over all. And that was what he was hoping for. And here comes Jesus, who he has just said, we know you're from God. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom, you must be born again. Now, an important note here. All right. The Jews and the early apostle, the apostles early on, I should say, misunderstood. They were thinking about an earthly kingdom. They thought that Daniel and the psalmist and all the other references was that God was going to establish a kingdom like David's, that it was going to have territory, that you could draw it on a map. 
But what Jesus is doing here is telling him about the true kingdom, which is a spiritual one. And as we'll see in a moment, that the citizens of that kingdom will no longer be limited to the Jews. Now, the second thing we see is a reference to being born again. All right? We see that reference there in verse 5. He says, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now, this is it, you know, this is reference, it's curveball. Okay? This is a curveball. Because the, the, this it's not, this is one of those things where there's not entirely a Jewish frame of reference for. Okay? There are some concepts that Jesus talks about. You have heard it say, an eye for an eye, but I tell you this. You must be born again. Not exactly, not only you must be born again, but that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. This was like he suddenly shifted gears into advanced trigonometry. <laughs> like he's doing calculus, and Nicodemus is back doing two plus two equals four. And so, this idea of being born again, ultimately it's an idea of renewal, of regeneration, of transformation, even, okay? And it has this duality of it, born of water and spirit, okay? And that's confusing, and there's been a lot of talk and documentation and argument over this idea. And... Effectively, it is a, the best way I can describe it, it is a physical action with a spiritual outcome. All right? It is a physical action with a spiritual outcome. If you are born of water, a physical thing, then you will be born of the spirit, a spiritual thing. You can't divorce the two. Okay? And it's not that it is, he says the same thing twice. All right? That's not it either. He says you are born of the water and you are born of the spirit. And he says that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So some have suggested that, you know, the being born of water is just talking about the same thing. But that's not what the text would tell us. Greek is a beautiful language. Sometimes it's a frustrating language when it gets a little vague. But here it is not vague. Here it is very specific. It is two different concepts with two different meanings. And so you go, well, okay, so there's this physical action that has a spiritual result, and it involves water. What could it be? <laughs> In Acts chapter 2, the Jews had that very same question, didn't they? In Acts chapter 2, they said, well, they heard about the story of Jesus, and the response is this. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you have a water component, and you have a spirit component, don't you? You have a physical action with a spiritual result, right? Now, the idea of baptism was not a new concept. The idea of baptism was a Jewish concept. So you go back, and the Jews had what was called a mikvah, or mitvah, uh, and it was a baptistry, okay? We, in the synagogues, they would have these baptistries, and they were used for ritual cleansing. John had a baptism. He would baptize there in the rivers, okay? Uh, and so we have this historical concept that God then says, this is the way it's going to be used from now on. Now, a Jewish baptism was for cleansing. It was for purification. Well, how much more so then if that idea is used now that Jesus has died for our sins? We've had that great sacrifice. We've had that precious gift. As a matter of fact, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, the apostle Peter St. Peter, there from Acts chapter 2, right, says, 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for in sincere brotherly love, love one another earnest from a pure heart, verse 23, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of the imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And so they had heard the word of God, the same word that Peter preached there in Acts chapter 2, 37 and 38, to repent and be baptized. All right, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Just to do a cannonball? <laughs> I was working with some youth one time, and, you know, it's always a struggle when you're working with teenagers because, you know, they, they're old enough to make decisions. They're not always old enough to make the right decisions. And there was a young man who they had studied with and uh, had decided that he would want to be baptized. And he got baptized, and it was a great thing, and rejoiced. The problem is, one of his cabin mates had told him, because it was at camp, so we did it at the pool, right? Had told him that once you get baptized, you get up out of the pool, then you go around to the diving board and do a cannonball back into the water. And he went, okay. And so didn't tell a soul. He got baptized. We're happy. We rejoice. He gets up out, walks around. What's he doing? Where is he going? And then he just runs and does a cannonball into the water. Yes. He was saved, though, right? He was saved. <laughs> Maybe he was just being doubly sure. I don't know. Praise God. But being baptized. It's not just a dip in the water, right? Right. That's not what it is, right? right? And it's not, it's not some symbol of you know big, very popular phrase. It's not an outward sign and inward change. That's not what the text, the text, the scripture tells us. If we read Acts two thirty eight, it says, "Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for a good conscience, for good feelings, because everybody else is doing it." No, it says for the forgiveness of sins. Quite literally, unto, pointing towards. And so, now, like we were talking about in the Bible class, could God have just said, believe, and boom, you're done. You're saved. Absolutely, he could have. You know why? Because he's God. Right. That's right. But everywhere we see in Scripture, God has wanted people to make a choice to obey him. And when we see those situations, God specifies a certain way of doing something. And he says, hey, if you believe in me, repent of your sins, and then be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, is there any power in the water? No. Okay? It can be river water. It can be creek water. It can be well water. I'm a little hesitant about Akron City water because I know too much about it. But you know what? You could baptize somebody in Akron City water. No, we have good water in Akron City. It comes from Rebel. Yeah, it does. It comes from Kent. Oh, okay. Yeah, it comes from Ken. Uh, but it's just one. What gives it power is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. There you go. And so as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about being born again, Nicodemus misses it, right? You read Nicodemus's response. He's like, well, how is that supposed to work? How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Yeah. It's like, that ain't going to work, Jesus. But see, Jesus is talking on one level, and Nicodemus is thinking on another level. And so then that brings us to the work of the Spirit. Now, as we go into verse 7, Jesus says, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. All right? The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone. Who is born of the Spirit? So now we have a couple of things here. Shifting gears a little bit. So Jesus says that you must be born of water and spirit. Which spirit? Holy Spirit, okay? And now he's saying to Nicodemus, look, I get that you don't get it, all right? But you need to not worry about it so much. You need to just trust God. So you and he uses the illustration of the wind, right? Where does the wind start? Well, look, you can have a bunch of meteorologists and scientists tell you, well, this, that, and happens. 
But from a functional standpoint, does the, does the wind start in Ravenna? Does it start in Akron? Does it start here? You know, last I looked, we're on a globe. Eventually, it'll go all the way around. Right? Sometimes the wind dies, especially this, that, and the other. I get that. The point that Jesus is making here is you have something that you can't see that has an actual impact. Right? It is something that you can't see, and yet you know it's real. And yet you see the end result. <clears throat> and so it is, too, with everyone which is born of the Spirit. So he's saying, Nicodemus, look, I get that you don't fully understand it, but you're going to know, all right? You're going to know who it is, the ones that have been born again. You're going to know, right? Jesus talks about that they'll know you're my disciples by what? Love. Yeah. But... Going back to Acts chapter 2, though, we see that the people I ask, they're cut to the heart. They say, you know, what must we do? Um, and so Peter responds, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you keep reading because it doesn't stop. Right. You go into Acts 2, 42 to 47, and this is what we read. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all any as had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Notice verse 37. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Mm -hmm. The people, in this instance, the Jews, you have these Christians who are getting together, they're fellowshipping, they're studying, they're sharing meals together. They're out in public together. They're doing these things together. And the people see the Christians, and the text tells us that they have favor with all the people. There wasn't a question about what the Christian was to act like. There wasn't a question about what they were to do, who they were to be. They knew who they were to be and whose they belonged to. And so as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and they have some more dialogue, Jesus is trying to get this fundamental concept across to Nicodemus. This thing you have been waiting for your whole life is going to require a change on your part. I know you don't understand it yet. I know that it may be a little difficult for you. But don't put limitations on God. Amen. Right? Don't put limitations on God. The Spirit goes where the Spirit wants to go. The Spirit's going to work in the way that the Spirit needs to work, and guess what? You will see the end result. You will see those who are born of the Spirit. You're going to know. Because lots of people get dunked in a water, tank of water, right? I go to the fair and dunk a clown in a tank of water. <laughs> that don't make him Christian when he comes up out of it, does it? I can get a hot tub and Take a dip in a hot tub, that doesn't make me Christian. It's being immersed in water. That's what baptism means for the forgiveness of your sins. It is an action with a purpose, and it is a physical action with a spiritual result. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that gift, it's not miraculous spiritual gifts. It's not speaking in tongues or anything like that. And if we have more time, we can go into those. So, and I can if you'd like afterwards. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is the sign and seal, as Paul will talk about, the guarantee that we have a spot in heaven. Amen. And that's what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus. Here's how you get into the kingdom. Right? And the great news is, is that that is a message for us as well. And so as we seek to be God's people, it begins with that journey, that obedience to the gospel. Amen. And God has made it so simple. 
we're reading through or studying through Exodus on Sunday mornings, and the amount of detail, you know, make it this long by this wide, you know, God, God wants a finished carpenter. He doesn't want a, a framer. You look at all the rules and regulations, but God simplified things down so much when he sent his son. He sent his son to die so that we might live. His Amen. son became the all-time sacrifice for our sins. Amen. And he said, hey, if you want to be part of the kingdom, it's really simple. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sins, and was resurrected on the third day, do something about it. If you repent of your sins, which just means asking God to forgive you of the sins that have stained your past, and you commit to live for him from this day forward. And then... You make a public confession of faith. And then you're immersed for the forgiveness of sins. Once you do that, you're what Paul calls a new creation. And you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a home in heaven. Amen. Then once you become a Christian, you strive each and every day to live a faithful life. We always like to extend the invitation because everybody's at a different spot in their spiritual journey. If you have yet obeyed the, not yet obeyed the gospel, then you need to. Uh, and so we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. If you're a Christian who perhaps is struggling, maybe you've stepped out of the kingdom uh, and uh, given in to sin, you can always come back. And if you need to make right with God in a private way, do it in a private way. If you need the church to pray with you about it, help you in some way, we're here for you. But my admonition, as it is every Sunday, don't leave here today without making sure that you're right with the Lord. And so if you need to respond to the invitation, we ask that you come at this time as together we stand and together we sing. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to Turn with me to 723. 
once again. That's number 723. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call. Set, set, set aside uh, to put uh, uh, towards the efforts here at, uh, in Ravenna, was in Portage County, to uh, have an outreach to those who are, are not saved, who need saved, who need to become the church. And uh, so uh, let's pray for uh, our offering this morning. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Father, you've given us cars and homes and clothes to wear, and the food that we eat, and Father, the air that we breathe, and we just thank you for that, and we thank you for the salvation you give us through Jesus Christ. Father, at this time, just help us that we might cheerfully give back uh, to you that the kingdom may be upheld and the word might be spread here locally in Ravenna. So I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, the part of the announcements I like the best is we started off this morning and we had visitors. Brother James Speedy coming down from Polio, thank you so much for coming down and really appreciated your words at the, at, at the table today. Thank you. Uh, I went to, went to the teenage class, Brother Belfont and I, and along with uh, Beck, we had Lily today visiting. And we really enjoyed her comments and we really enjoyed having her in class today. Uh, also, uh, we have Jackie came. And Jackie was looking for a Bible that was easier to read. Are you taken care of? Are you okay? You got, you got, uh, oh, good, okay. <laughs> we got her an ESV. Sometimes it's hard to understand that old time uh, 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 King James Version. And they do have a new new King James Version. Now, I couldn't lay my hands on one this morning to give you. We did, but uh, uh, bro brother, brother Matt and uh, Brother Tom worked and we found one. <laughs> also, we have a family, Tina. Uh, uh, or excuse me, Tim, uh, uh, Tim and Erica. Tim and Erica are here with us, and 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 uh, their daughter and son, uh, Eliana, 
and, uh, and, and Gideon. I'm so glad you guys could be here today and worship, worship with us uh, at the service. Amen. On our prayer list, we want to include some items that aren't in the uh, aren't in the bulletin. Please pick up a bulletin on your way out if you haven't already picked one up. But we have to add to it on our prayer list the Rodney Eddy family again. Uh, this morning, uh, Gila told me that we need to pray for Jason Eddy, Rodney's son. Uh, he had injured his foot, and by the time that he got things taken care of in the hospital, he lost his leg from the knee down. He's uh, 47 years old. Now, he's young, he'll get over it. They have some great prosthetics, but it's tough. It's a tough thing. Pray for that family. He just lost his sister two weeks ago. She passed away at the age of 48. So pray for this family. The, the, the Rodney Eddy family, and Gila and John, and, you know, Amongst the things that we have planned, of course, we have our food giveaway February the 14th. Uh, Valentine's Day, we're giving away food here. You know anybody that's in need, please have them uh, uh, come uh, stop by uh, in between 9 and 11 uh, on our food giveaway. We're, we're just one of several food banks that work and operate in the county, uh, and we are on the list. Uh, there's a men's inspirational day at Norwood Park Church of Christ in Zanesville and March the 2nd. Also, March the 2nd, there's a lady state for Church of Christ in Columbus. Do we know what church that is? Did anybody look up on that? Do you know which church in Columbus? I'm sorry? I think it's probably been Fish and Urine King. Uh, uh, okay, Fish and King. Thank you. Uh, down where uh, uh, Patty and uh, Noah would attend. Uh, so, uh, April the 6th, the Alcoa Road Church of Christ has the Bible Bowl. The registration is due by the 31st. Uh, also, uh, we have two ministers, but we have zero pastors, elders, if you will. And since uh, then, we have been running kind of on a committee, and Bill has left us, and uh, our committee has gathered on, on a somewhat regular basis to take care of the day-to-day -day things that need to be done with the church, but also we need to do some planning. And in planning, we want all the men. We would like to have all the men at the meeting so that we might plan together for things that uh, we, we want to have happen in growing the church here in Ravenna and any special events and our next fellowship. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, please write down in your calendar, men. We're going to try to assemble next Sunday at 4 o'clock, before services at 4 o'clock p.m. Sunday the 18th. Is the 11th? Yeah. Okay. Sunday the 18th, next Sunday afternoon. Uh, if you can be here, please mark your calendar. We'll get as many folks here as possible. Uh, I don't have anything else to mention. Does anyone else have an item that we need to share? Uh, Tom? Oh, and 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 two. Uh, we we have a we have a new a new brother in Christ who is Amen. with us today for the first time. Dan, since he was Amen. baptized a couple weeks ago, Dan. It's, it's good to have you here. Uh, thank you very much.